I'm not, I'm not going to preach or make anything, but there's so much today in the church that's not the word, and it's there because there's a group that doesn't want to hear it. But I believe you're here tonight because you want to hear the thus saith the Lord. How many just wants to have God talk to your heart tonight? Amen. Brother Estes, come and take the service. Let's worship him tonight. And love the Lord tonight, don't you? Yes. I appreciate that. appreciate your pastor. And how very, very true to, to sense the presence and the anointing of the Lord. And I believe, I believe in the anointing. Perhaps we don't stress it enough. Perhaps we sometimes want to overlook it or minimize it. But young people, I want you to encourage you. Don't just sing. Sing with the anointing. Congregation, don't just try to pray. Praise with an anointing on your heart. That, that inexplainable yet undeniable unction of the Spirit of God that moves inside of a congregation where we hunger and thirst for the Lord. And He comes by and blesses us with His divine presence. We need the anointing church. Amen. And I come right alongside your pastor just to reiterate what he said. I am so thankful for a congregation, for a people that desire to hear the word of God. I, 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 I've, t I've told Eric, I said, man, I said, boy, there's, there's a lot of guys out there. They are so good at coming up with these thoughts. You ever, you ever just, man, I got a good thought tonight. And I'm like, oh, I wish I had a thought sometimes. Erica said, no, 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 no. Don't, don't ever minimize God's word for man's thought. <laughs> And I know maybe, that, maybe that's a sermon to me. You didn't need that. I needed that, huh? But I appreciate the Word of God. I do. I appreciate the Word of God going forth. And I appreciate a congregation that's hungry for the Word of God. Amen. Yeah, hallelujah. Well, I think Sister Estes has got something to say tonight. And so does Sister Estes. And so does Sister Estes. And so does Sister Estes. Hallelujah. Amen. This day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Give my hand. That's John 14, 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 1 through 6. Thank you, girls. Thank you very much, girls. I appreciate that. Appreciate my wife. Appreciate her helping these little girls day in and day out. Sometimes we're on the road. And we I have to be one place and they have to be the next uh, back home. And uh, always, every morning at 8.15. Sometimes I have to do it at 7.15 because I'm central time. Uh, but we've got our devotions there together. And she's got those kids lined up on that couch. And I just, you know, you get to look. It's not like it used to be. Thank the Lord, you know. You get to look at the girls. Hey, girls. Hey, Dad. And 800 miles away, you still get to have a devotion. It's not as good as being right there. 
But you know, dads, if, if you want to pray with them, you'll find a way to pray with them, won't you? And oh, I thank the Lord, and, and mercy knows we don't, we don't have all the answers. I'm a pilgrim on this journey, I can assure you. You know, the problem with parenting is just about the time you got it figured out, they enter a new age group. You're just right back there. Man, I mean, you got it figured out for back then, but boy, these new things have come up, huh? But uh, I, I, do, I do want to strive to be a godly family. I heard a man today, and he was given his definition of success, and that's fine. And I stopped, and I said, my definition of success is having those closest to me love and respect me the most. Now, everybody's got a different definition of success. I mean, some, it's, you know, million-dollar homes and five cars and all that, and that's, that's between them and God. But mine would be, let those closest to me love and respect me the most. To be really honest with you, now, I, I appreciate your church. Believe me, I love you. You know I do. And I appreciate every kind word that you say. But let me tell you what really counts is when I get back in that car and Savannah says, good job, Dad. Or Annalise says, good job, Dad. Or Ashley, good job, Dad. That's what really, really matters. Amen. I appreciate your church. I appreciate your giving. I appreciate your sacrifice. Let me visit with you for just a second. We'll get right into the Word of God tonight. In fact, you can be turning to Exodus chapter 17 if you'd like. Exodus 17, verses 8 through 10. And uh, then over in the book of Galatians 5, 16 through 18. Let me repeat that to you again. Exodus 17 tonight, verses 8 through 10, and then Galatians 5 and 16. I do say I appreciate your, your giving and your, your sacrificial giving. Now, most of us, I mean, they, they see, okay, brother, sister, S is the evangelist, and that's good. There's another side that we have as well, and I, I'm, I'm just as equally passionate and interested in teaching as I am preaching. And, and as one man said, preaching makes for converts, teaching makes for disciples. And God's opened up a lot of doors for us overseas as well to be able to try to pour into ministers all literally all across this world. One of my mentors when I was a young man, his name was Brother B.H. Clendenin. Some of you are familiar with that name. And if there's one thing that Brother Clendenin and I felt like burned into my heart was the necessity of equipping and raising up. You can't preach to everybody, but if you can equip another, then they can go and be free from the blood of all men's hands. Amen. All, uh, be free from the, uh, the blood of all men, if you will. And now that was his vision when I was a young man, but I can certainly say I, I believe I've adapted that so much to my life that it's truly ingrained in my philosophy of ministry. In fact, I was on the phone today uh, with a preacher missionary out to Europe, and uh, I was so blessed. I, 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 I tried to send off per month, a different leadership lesson over to Croatia. And this morning I received an email from one of their pastors. And they said, we'd like to translate what you had and post that and uh, republish that uh, for our churches, and which I'm just delighted for. And they said, well, well you know, by, by all means, whatever it can do to help you and your church, that's what it's there for. Uh, so I, I appreciate you not only giving to the work of an evangelist, but truly having a missions mind and, a, and, a, and literally a, a world vision, if you will, to, to see the work of God go forward, not just here in your local church, but to literally reach all the way from Drexel to Jerusalem. And so when you do give, not only are you able to help with the daily maintenance of an evangelist, but there's also seeds that are able to go to that to be able to help us in our overseas endeavors as well. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We truly want to say thank you. God bless you. Exodus tonight, chapter number 17. Thank you for the standing of the reading of the Word of God. Exodus tonight, 17, verses 8 through 10. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us out men and go out. Fight. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the mountain with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Galatians 5, please. Galatians 5 and verse number 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now church, that is a promise and a commandment. 
conflated into one scripture. Walk in the Spirit. You'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Commandment, promise. Both right there. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. So these are contrary the one to the other. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. In other words, you cannot do that on your own. Your self-help program is not going to help you in that area. Your psychology will not help you in that area. You need the Spirit of God. And the Bible says this in verse number 18. If ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you're led of the Spirit of God, friend, you're not bound by that old man. I want to, I want to just preach for just a, just a few moments this morning, this evening. A foe called flesh. A foe called flesh. You going to help me tonight? Let's slip up our hands to heaven and ask the Lord to have His way in the remainder of this house. Father, I thank You. I bless You. You're a mighty good God and You care for Your people tonight. I thank you, God, for every heart that's in this house today. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that your word of God can go forward and it will not return void. And I'm praying in the name of the Lord that you would touch every word spoken and everything said. That you would anoint and that you would help. Give your word, God, liberty to move upon hearts tonight. I pray, God, meet us around these altars. And for this, I give you the glory and the honor and the praise in the lovely holy name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord this evening. Now, friend, you have three major enemies in this life. Sometimes we make a mistake and we say, well, we only have one enemy. It is Satan. Now, Satan may be, may be your arch enemy, but he's not your only enemy. Satan is an enemy against your life. But there's another enemy out there, and it's called the world. The world is still an enemy. The world is not a misunderstood friend. The world is not somebody we can try to come close to. The world is something God's Word said we're to come out from and be separate from. We're not to be conformed to them. In fact, biblically speaking, the opposite of courage is not cowardice. The opposite of courage from the biblical perspective is conformity. When we conform to this world, God says there's no courage in our heart. It takes courage to leave that world alone. It takes courage to say we want to live holy. It takes courage to say we want to live pure. Friend, the world is not a misunderstood friend. It is still an enemy that's trying to take your soul away from a vibrant living relationship with God. But that's not the only enemy there either. Because Satan is an enemy. The world is an enemy. But guess what? Your old flesh is an enemy as well. Now I know we live in a day of 2015 or if you have any problem in the world all you got to do is blame it on the devil but mister that's not how the Bible reads. Amen. I know we have people out there say well you know I mean I, I've just got such a spirit of anger. It's always a spirit of anger and it's always some devil out there that's making them angry. That's why I point my finger at my wife and shake it. No sir, no ma'am. Quit blaming it on the devil. It may be the man in the mirror. It may be the woman in the mirror. We're looking for somebody to cast out a devil out of somebody and you don't cast out flesh. You've got to crucify that flesh. Amen. You've got to pray it through. you got to let it die. Paul said he dies daily. He crucifies his flesh daily. We must do the same, church. It's that lower part of that human nature that has a proclivity to wander away from God. Now, don't pretend like it's not there. Now, I know there's some of you, bless God. I mean, I got to everything I ever needed back in 1982 and never had a problem since. We have a deliverance service for liars, sir. Because you have had temptation since 1982. And you've had trouble since then as well. And what's the biggest source of your trouble? It may just be the flesh. It may be that old nature like the law of gravity. It tries to pull you away. It tries to pull you down. You know, if, if anybody ever started talking about once saved, always saved, we'd say, now hold on, wait a second, brother. That's just, we don't believe in all that once saved, always saved stuff. But friend, what about when it comes to that? flesh do we really believe that all we had to do was just come down and pray one time and never have a battle with that old 
nature. That's not how God's word shows us. In fact, in the word of God, he loves you and me so much uh, and he gives us examples and he gives us lessons uh, and he gives us living, breathing a people that can show us what he's speaking about. And in God's word, uh, there is an example of how the flesh comes against the people of God. Now in the Old Testament, what did Egypt represent? Some of you are scared to death. You wish you would have went to Sunday school class now, don't you? I'll start calling on people. See how many people start sweating, huh? In the Old Testament, Egypt represents the world. I was preaching a revival in North Carolina, and there were some Muslims down the road at a little place we'd go eat. And I finally, we finally got that Muslim owner to come into church that one night. And I thought out of all nights, please don't start singing that song. Egypt was once my home. I was in sin. He was from Egypt. I thought, please, they didn't sing it. But very symbolically, Egypt represents the world. Or Brother Norvell, if Egypt represents the world, what does Pharaoh represent? Satan. Satan. He is the one that tries to keep them from finding freedom. He is the one that tries to keep them from being able to worship God like they want to with all their heart, all their mind, all their strength, everything within them. Pharaoh is very symbolic of Satan himself. Well, brother, that's just if Egypt represents the world and Satan represents the, uh, 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 Pharaoh represents Satan. Who represents the flesh? Enter a man by the name of Amalek. Amalek. It was the Amalekites who were the first people to attack Israel when they departed out of Egypt on their way to the Canaan land promise. And friend, can I tell you the first thing that's going to attack you whenever you finally let loose of that world and turn loose of the reins of Satan is going to be that old man that says, put me back on the crown and put Jesus back on the cross. No, sir. Friend, we've got to bring that old man under subjection. It's going to be a battle day in and day out. It's going to be a struggle day in and day out. But there's going to be a war that's going to be fought and it's going to be spirit against flesh and flesh against spirit and Amalek represents the flesh he's the grandson of Esau you remember Esau don't you Esau's a man that says listen I don't care about the future feed me right now I don't care about tomorrow What can gratify my flesh instantly? Give me that bowl of beans. You can have the birthright. Just give me the beans. So now Amalek, as a grandson of Esau, he becomes not only a picture, but a progenerator, a type of men and women that are not interested in the future, but only interested in the present. And the Lord says in Exodus 17 and 14, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. I will utterly put out of the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. What's he saying to you and me? The Lord says, I will have nothing to do with this old man and old nature. You don't try to make the old man better. You let the old man die. But that don't tell me before we're brother. That's just, if I could just get better, then I'd come and get saved. Well, I want to ask him, how much better? How much better do you think you need to get before God says you're finally worthy to get saved? Friend, You'll never get there. You don't make the old man better. You make the old man dead. You let Jesus come in and you say, Lord, tear down this old man and keep him dead and keep him good and dead. Hallelujah. I want to remind you something. The Lord says, I will never accept that old man. I'll never agree with him on his terms. I'll never compromise what Calvary meant to my darling son in order to make an appeasement with that old nature, whether we want to admit it or not. The Lord doesn't love this old Adamic nature, but he does love his darling son. And he's willing, if Jesus can live through you, he'll take you to heaven with him. He says there in Malachi, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob. Listen, I hated Esau. Now remember, he's not speaking about a person. He's speaking about a group. And I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. 
Whereas Edom saith we are impoverished, but we will return. We will build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build what I will throw down. They shall call them the borders of wickedness, the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever and ever. Brother Estes, what does that mean in good old-fashioned English? The Lord said, I tore down this place. I made it desolate. I destroyed everything. And that old Esau, he turns around and he says, hey, don't worry. I'll build back up this old place again. That's exactly what flesh says. Flesh says, you may tear me down one Sunday but if you don't pray until next Thursday I will take back what you took from me if you don't keep it dead and keep it down and old nature says I will build it back up again I've seen people get great victory at an altar and think well that's enough for three months and the flesh says you took it away from me but if you leave me alone, I will regain it. You know, I remember back when we lived in Mississippi. Had a little swing set in the backyard. Girls, you remember that swing set in the backyard? And remember they had that fence right beside that? And I'd go back there and I'd cut those branches back. I mean, I got little girls playing, you know, tag and chase and everything else back there. I didn't want to, you know, get a branch in their eye or something like that. So I'd cut that thing back. And we'd be gone, I mean, sometimes, you know, two, three months at a time. And I remember one time when I came back to that house. And Brother Richmond, I looked in that backyard. And those branches that I had cut back, those branches that I had pushed back, you know what had happened? They had grown back over that fence. You know what they're telling me? They're telling me, Zane, if you'll just leave me alone, I will take back what you took from me. If you just leave me alone, I'll take back over the area that you took from me. The Bible said, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It didn't say you had to rob a bank. It didn't say you had to be a mass murderer. It didn't say you had to be one of the top ten most wanted in the post office. But when you neglect, when you let that old nature have its way, when you let that old man rise up again and you don't put it down, the Lord asks a rhetorical question. How shall a man escape? How shall a man leave? How shall a man be ready for the rapture if his flesh still dominates his spirit and what we need is men and women again how to be dominated by the spirit of God God says there'll be no truce between me and him there'll never come a generation there'll never come a time where I wink at what that old flesh wants to do there'll never come a day where I'll take light what that old flesh wants to do the Lord says there will always be indignation. Put it down plain, wide, and straight. The Lord will never accept the offering of that old man. Friend, hear me. Amalek stands for a principle tonight. And it's a principle that God hates. And that's the flesh. God says, I'll receive no glory from that. I'm at war with that. Hallelujah, friend, hear me. God saves us. But just because God saves us doesn't mean there's not going to be a fight. There is a certainty of our fight. In Exodus 17 and 5, the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel the rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee whereupon the rock of Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. At the people may drink. Then, verse 8, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose you out men and go fight with Amalek. Wait a second. That shouldn't be there. It is. Oh, hallelujah. We got miracles. We got God's blessings. We got the Lord touching. And right in the middle of all that good stuff, Guess who shows up? You ever heard people say, Woo! We're going to have such a move of God, it's going to run the devil out of town. You understand whenever you really have a move of God, he doesn't run out of town. He shows back up in Sunday school. <laughs> and right in the middle of all these good things, guess what's there? The flesh. The flesh, right in the middle of God pouring out His Spirit, 
guess what's always around that corner? The flesh. The flesh. Friend, don't be so naive to think just because God is pouring out His Spirit that now you can let down your guard. It doesn't work like that. God says it's a never-ending battle. There'll be a battle today. There'll be a battle tomorrow. They just got finished drinking water out of a rock. Could you imagine what kind of service that have been? Hey, how did God move last night in y'all's church? Well, we had about three million get water out of a rock. I'd say that's a great move of God. And in the blessing, in the blessing, in the blessing, there was still something that was fighting them. Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? In the greatest blessing our church will ever find, you've still got to come against that old nature. Revival was there. And it should be a great time of blessing. And Amalek is right around the corner. Friend, I once heard of how Charles Spurgeon at a Bible school, they called him the governor. We would call it a principal. They called it a governor. And he said there was a young man that was up preaching one evening. And the, the governor said it was a masterpiece. Oh, he said the homiletical unity that that man had. He said that young boy articulated every point so well. The pathos was so driven. The intellect was so deep. He was speaking on the full armor of God. And Charles Spurgeon said it was so dynamic you could, you could almost hear each piece clank right into place. And at the end of that young man's message he stood and said, Aha! Where's the enemy now? To which Charles Spurgeon in a stage whisper leaned over to the man next to him and said, He's inside the armor. He's still there. He's still there. Hey, I'm talking to somebody. After some of your greatest blessings, you're going to fight your biggest battles. I said after some of your greatest blessings you're going to fight some of your biggest battles. Friend, there's a certainty of our fight. I said there's a certainty of our fight and there's a strategy of our foe. You wouldn't expect him right here. You wouldn't expect that he would come right at this kind of time. You wouldn't expect that he would come on such the heels of a wonderful blessing. But you hear me again. Sometimes your biggest battles will be right on the heels of your greatest blessings right after God blesses you. The flesh shows up right after after the miracle comes, the flesh shows up right after you get a promotion. The flesh shows up right after you get that bill paid. The flesh shows up. Never underestimate what that old man will try to do. Elijah calls down fire from heaven. 450 prophets of Baal have their birth certificate made a null and void statement. The next thing you know, you know what he's doing? He's underneath a juniper tree, biting his nails, scared to death. That old man has got him in a grip. Let me tell you something, beloved. The flesh attacks unexpectedly. I said the flesh attacks unexpectedly unexpectedly. Moses right after he comes to a Red Sea requests that he would die. Jonah after he's been with revival in Nineveh requests that he might die. Psalm 22 and 20 said deliver my soul from the sword my darling from the power of the dog. Friend if you don't value your soul more than you do this old man you'll not be delivered from that dog. There's a war. There's a battle. Your darling that's your soul. The dog that's that old nature and you got to learn who's going to win, who's going to lead, who's going to be in control. And there's no time to have a compromise with this old man. It is truly winner take all. Can you say amen? And you know where he attacks him? I love it. Rephidim. 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 He attacks in Rephidim. You know what Rephidim means? A place of rest. A place. Amalek, you're not supposed to be there. This is my six month vacation. This is my time off from church because I got such a busy life. Well, you know, we got kids and they got aunts and they got cousins and we got all this ahead of us. 
And if we don't go to every last thing that every last person's doing, then we, we, they'll be upset with us. Friend, you call it whatever you want to, but I want to remind you there's an old nature out there that takes point every time you miss the house of God. That marks down every time you avoid a prayer meeting. That marks down every time when you should have been fasting and you didn't. That old nature takes note of it. And oh, come on, don't back up on me there. All I'm saying is that old man will fight every single day. He never takes a day off. He never takes a vacation. You may take a fast from the Spirit of God, but that old enemy doesn't take a fast from trying to pull you down. Well, we got busy. You don't have anybody but Sister Shilcox here, do you? Okay. Sister Shilcox come over. And boy, she come over right about 530. And you can't do anything but just entertain her. No, you can look at her and say, Sister Shilcox, I'm so glad you're here. Church starts at 6. Would you like to come? Just a thought. I'm just saying, you be careful. That old nature doesn't take a day off. He looks at him. It's a place of rest. It's a place of support. And Amalek says this is a mighty good time to try to get a hold of them. Friend, the flesh attacks unexpectedly. The flesh attacks indirectly. Deuteronomy 25 and 17. Am I boring you tonight? Deuteronomy 25 and 17 reads like this. Now it's the story of Exodus again. It's in a different book. It's, a, it's the story again. It said, remember what Amalek did unto thee, by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt. God is saying, do you, remember, do you remember what Amalek did to you? Do you remember how Amalek got a better hand on you? How he met thee by the way and smote the hindermost part of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee. When thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. The Lord said, don't you remember what that old man did to you? Don't you remember how he pulled your victory away? Don't you remember how he took your joy? Don't you remember how he stole your song? Don't, don't you remember how he smote those that were in the hindermost? Those that were feeble? You say, Brother Estes, does it really matter if I get in at an altar? Listen, God can touch you right there. God can touch you back there. And God can touch you right here. But it's more than a physical location. It's a heart position. And if you're hanging out in the back, then I can assure you, you are a prime target for Amalek. If you're not pressing in at an altar, wherever you may be, I can assure you Amalek is looking at you and says, I will take care of them first. I'll take those that are feeble first. I'll take those that are weary first. I'll take those that are cutting it short first. Amalek. Amalek attacks We're at your weakest point. God tests you at your strongest point. Amalek tempts you at your weakest point. And the problem sometimes is we have weak points that we don't realize they're weak points. And an ooh. Sometimes we have weak points that in ourself we think are strong points. And if you've got a strong point that's really a weak point, that's a double weak point. Because now every time somebody comes alongside you and begins to deal with it and begins to pull it up and begins to show it to you and God's word begins to reveal it rather than saying, God, is it me? Lord, deal with me and sanctify me. And Jesus, come upon my heart. And God, whatever it may be that's causing me to go down this road, or God, take it from me. Take it. Instead of any of those things, we begin to say, oh, well, I got this one under control. I can think of a young man in our movement. He's no longer in our movement. I had a pastor friend tell me. He was preaching revival for him where there was a camp meeting a little ways away. And Brother Steve, the day speaker didn't show up. And they asked, they said, can, can your preacher come for one of the morning services? And he'll be back in time to preach that night service. And sure did. And he said, Brother Estes, that young man preached like a house of fire. That young man was so anointed. I'm telling you, there were things that were there. I, nobody else knew. And at the end of that service, there was an elder preacher there. He's one of the heads over that camp meeting. Brother Begley, he looked at that young preacher and he said, God's got his hand on you. 
He's about to open up a door for you. And just went down the line of how God's going to bless him and give him a church and bless him in so many ways. And then at the very end, the elder preacher said, but you've got to stay humble. And that other preacher told me it was a one-hour drive back to that church. And he said for 59 minutes, he did all the talking. About, Look, did you hear what God said? How he's going to bless me and open up doors and give me all these things. Did you hear all that? He said, finally, I got a word in edgewise. And I said, didn't he also say, you got to watch yourself to be humble? And Brother Norvell, that young preacher said back to the older preacher, I'm not even worried about that. An unguarded weakness is a double weakness. Hey, there's been times preachers have preached, and I knew it wasn't me. But I'm telling you what I did. I hit that altar and said, God, lest it ever become me. Erica, do you remember that time we were at a service? And there was a message in tongues and an interpretation and said, Thus saith the Lord, there were five people and they were caught up in such and such sin. Can I tell you, all I knew was it wasn't me and it wasn't my wife, but the hair on the back of my neck was still standing up under the fear of God. And I said, Lord God, I know that ain't me, but Jesus, I fear you. I don't want to lose the fear of God. I don't want to lose the fear of God. I don't want to bust a, a boast myself and strut around like I'm that. No, sir, friend, we ain't made it to heaven yet. And we we need to keep on praying and we need to keep on pressing in and we need to keep on seeking the Lord. We got to put down this old man and be aware it's an enemy and old flesh is an enemy and old flesh is an enemy. Lord, take care of it. He attacks unexpectedly. He attacks indirectly. He attacks arrogantly. Now when I type this in my little search engine on my Bible. I'm not saying there's maybe not another phraseology that could go this way, but this is the only one that I found with these words, and he feared not God. Only one place in the Bible that I come across that. Deuteronomy 25 in the latter half of 18. And he feared not God. Wait a second. Devils believe and they tremble. In fact, that word in the Greek for tremble literally means to bristle the hair on the back of your neck standing straight up. Devils believe and they tremble, but not the flesh. Not the flesh. The flesh doesn't fear God. The flesh can go out there and live like an absolute hypocrite and get right up on this platform and sing with the best of them. Say amen. That flesh can scream at his wife. That wife can scream at her husband. She can use profanity and shake her fist and walk right back inside of this church and act like everything's okay and we ain't got a problem in the world. My God, devils wouldn't even act like that. Devils would tremble before that, but not this old flesh. It is arrogant. It does not fear the Lord. Flesh can walk in and be just as smooth as oil, knowing the whole time there's sins, there's hidden things, there's ungodliness. And I'll be honest with you, right over here, a guy in the white shirt, I'll be honest with you. There's been a time or two. I never saw it, Brother Perry. I never saw it. I never saw it coming. They did such a good job of hiding it. They did such a good job of putting a mask over it. They did such a good job of playing the part. Now, I know some people say, well, bless God, I always knew there was something. Well, if you knew there was something there, why weren't you praying about it? If you knew there was something there, why didn't you have a great come on here? We don't need any more late prophets. Well, I knew something was there. But I'm telling you, that flesh has a way of walking in. It can shake your hand. It can smile. It can look you in the eye and pretend like there's nothing there. But there is an all-seeing, all-knowing hand and eye of God. And He can discern what men cannot discern. And He can see through you like transparent glass. And you may be able to get it over this preacher and that preacher and this man and that man. But you cannot get it by the all-seeing, all-knowing hand and eye of God. I mentioned this today to somebody. It's an amazing thought, Brother Brian. Jesus, he speaks to Peter, but he doesn't stop there. He speaks through Peter. 
And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. He's talking to the devil. For thou savorest the things that be of men. Did you just hear what God said? Jesus did not say, Peter, get away. You're acting like a devil. He said, devil, get away. You're acting just like a man. You're acting like a man. And that's the one thing I won't put up with. I will not. To devil, you get away from me. You remind me of unregenerated man. Friend, we are not as lofty as we think we are. I know in our self-help generation, all you got to do is believe good about yourself. That doesn't work that way with God. It still takes old-fashioned repentance. It still takes old-fashioned turning away. It still takes old-fashioned asking the Lord to forgive you of your old sin. That you might have a born-again experience. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Me and Brother Steve walk out the door one morning together. Good to see you, Brother Steve. How you been? Good, good, good to see you. And all of a sudden, this stranger walks by. And all of a sudden, that stranger balls up his fist. Pow! Ooh! And hits Brother Steve right in the nose. And Brother Steve says... I forgive you for that. I forgive you of that. And then that man has the arrogance to look back at Brother Steve and says, <laughs> No need for you to forgive me. I, I've already forgiven myself for that. Thank you very much. You see, I've learned the worst thing I can ever feel is guilt about what I've done wrong. So therefore, I forgive me. I don't need you to forgive me. That's exactly what that old unregenerated man does. He looks for every way to wash away his conviction and sin. He turns to booze. He turns to drugs. He turns to perversion. He turns to pornography. He turns to lying and cheating because he's trying to wash away the guilt of yesteryear. But friend, there'll be a God you have to answer to one day and you might as well just turn it over to the Lord and confess your sin and forsake your sin and let His mercy come and set you Pray. That's what the old nature does. That's what the old nature's like. I'm closing. Give me a minute or two. Friend, there's a certainty of our fight. There's a strategy of our foe. But there is a victory in our faith. Can you say amen? And Moses said unto Joshua, I love, we're getting right back where we started. Choose us out, men, go fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I'll stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said unto him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand. And Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat there on. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hand the one on the one side the other on the other side his hands were steady until the going down of the sun and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword there is still an answer for the old nature and it's the power of God can somebody say man get the picture Zach no help me here tonight Bubba. come on you too no you ain't getting out of this you nervous? You need to be. <laughs> Kidding, son. Stay right here. Right over here. Zach, you be Aaron, okay? Noah, you be her. <laughs> Amen. I wish it was him, but it's her. So, <laughs> so he's a man's man. He can handle it. How look? <laughs> and here's Moses. And he's fighting Amalek. He's fighting the old nature. And there's something inside of his hand. 
It's a rod, but it's no ordinary rod. It's no longer defined as the rod of Moses. That's the rod that parts Red Seas. That's the rod that he can dip and touch inside of that river. That's the rod that he can make miracles come for. It's no longer the rod of Moses. It is now the rod of God. And that rod represents something. It represents the power of God Almighty. Well, you say, well, Brother Essis, how can I get that kind of power? I'm, I'm glad you asked. How can you get that kind of power? I didn't think you would ask. But the Bible said it like this. Acts 1 and 8. Ye shall receive power after that which the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's the kind of power we need. So here you have Aaron. He's holding one hand. Here you have her. And he's holding another and it represents power from on high. Power from on high. Not your self-help group. Not looking in the mirror 25 times a day. Not crossing your fingers and saying, I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. We need to get the policeman off the street and put him back inside of our heart. And you don't get that just by convincing yourself. It takes the power of God to do that in your life. And here it is on one side. Aaron, his name meaning light, and her, his name, meaning white. What do you believe that means, Brother Estes? I believe it means this. On one side, there's revelation. On the other side, there's sanctification. On one side, there's praise. On the other side, there's purity. On one side, there's worship. On the other side, there's a selling out. What does it take for a man to get filled with the Holy Ghost? There's got to be some purity. I said there's got to be purity. But don't forget, beloved, there has got to be some praise. There's got to be some worship. There's got to be some sacrifice. And we've got to have both of them if God's going to endure us with the power of God. Can you say amen? Now here's the problem. we got some people, and man, they don't mind worshiping. Woo! 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 Relax, relax. I'm, not, I'm just relaxing. I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> and they don't mind worshiping. And we need that. We need that. But you know what? When you look at their life and say, are you ready to turn over the sin? Are you ready to delete it? Are you ready to get rid of it? Are you ready to have a true change of heart? They say, no, 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 I'm not sure about that. They know how to worship. And I'm not against that. I'm not saying you got to shout just like that. You understand what I'm saying. They know how to worship, but they don't know how to act pure. They don't know how to turn it over. They don't know how to give it to God. They are lacking something in their life. But wait a second. Because over here, we got some people, and they don't mind being, I mean, absolute, thank God for it, blue ribbon, plain vanilla. Woo! I'm for it. I'll never get it. I'll never, I'll never get it. I'll just, I'll do one of those things like that. You ever seen this? I'll just sit here and he'll just have to. He probably won't even do that. And you know what they do? I can't. You can't put your finger on their life. You can't. You can't put your finger on their life. I'm not saying they're not living pure. I'm not saying God hadn't touched them and they've given up things. But you know, I thank God. I've seen a lot of folks get baptized in the Holy Ghost. But I'll be, I've never seen anybody get baptized in the Holy Ghost just with their head down, with a sad look on their face, and with absolutely no worship in their heart. When I've seen them get baptized in the Holy Ghost, they were hungry for purity. But they were hungry for praise. I said they were hungry for praise. And they were hungry for purity. It takes both. It takes both. Give us a church again that knows how to worship. Knows how to praise. Knows how to call on God. Knows how to live pure. Knows how to live right. Somebody give him praise. Thank you, Air. Thank you, her. And when you got both together, there's something that takes place. There's a battle that's won. And the battle 
is over the flesh. And you know the amazing thought, Brother Steve? What happens out there really all depends on what happens right here. You don't know what? You want to know if you're going to win that battle at work tomorrow? Let me tell you how you know if you're going to win that battle at work tomorrow. Before you ever step foot out of that door, ask God to fill you again. Ask God to baptize you fresh. Ask the Lord to fill you over and over. For this is how am I going to win the battle? Ask God to fill you with the power and the anointing of the Lord. And every time Amalek tries to raise up against you, I'm telling you, beloved, that power of God can still push back the enemy. Erica, help me here tonight. Thank you, boys. Honey, help me here tonight. Brother Maggard, that Amalek is arrogant. He fears not God. But there's one thing that he can't stand up against, and that's still the power of the Spirit of God. How do you know that, Brother Estes? Because God's Word said this, Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Live in the Spirit of God. Let God fill you over and over again. And that battle that you've been faced with, you can find victory over, and you can find victory through. And if you would just walk in the Spirit of God, I'm here to tell you, Amalek does not stand a chance against a Spirit-filled child of God. We need hearts again to get hungry for the baptism of the Holy Ghost in their life and to be filled with overflowing and won't just come down to an altar and mumble a few words but lift their hands to heaven and truly worship God with everything within them. And won't just be concerned about how fast they can run. You're not impressing anybody. But truly out of a sincere heart, say, Lord, if there's any way, anything, anything in between, take it, Lord. And I, that I might walk with you. That your spirit might anoint me. Friend, hear me. It worked in the days of the Bible. And it will work today. Can you say amen? You can start any time you'd like. We had a friend of ours that we met in North Carolina. Chris Allen was his name. He said he was severely hooked on cocaine before the Lord saved him. God baptized Chris in the Holy Ghost. And he started becoming a street preacher. Oh, Chris would get out on that street corner, and I mean, son, it's retro 1950s as it could be. And Chris saw souls saved. Preach the gospel and people get saved. It's amazing. He said one evening he's out there in Brother Aaron. He said a man walks by and he's in this cloak and he's got a very sinister look on his face. And he said, I noticed him when he walked by and he made eye contact with me and I kept on preaching. He said, I got finished preaching that night. And on my way as I turned the corner to go back down that alley, to go back to my car, he said, out of the shadows walked that man with a handful of cocaine. And he said, he caught me right when I was inhaling and all that cocaine. He said, I breathed. And he said, when I did, he said, I started feeling that devil rip around my neck one more time. He said, I could feel my veins start dilating. I could feel my heart start palpitating. <sighs> and at that time, he looked up and he said just one word. Jesus. 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 And he said, before you know it, he's worshiping God. And the Holy Ghost begins to move on him. And the Spirit of God begins to speak to him with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the others. And he said, before you know it, he said, I felt those veins starting to constrict again. He said, I felt my heart go back to its normal pace. He said, brother, that's just, just like that. It was just like before it ever did happen. All I know is there's no weapon formed against us that's going to prosper. But every tongue that rises up in judgment, the Bible says, thou shalt condemn. Hallelujah, there's victory. There's still victory. There's still victory. Reminds me of that old. You heard about those old boys out there fishing that day. That game warden's out there and he's biding by that law and that other man finally takes a stick of dynamite, lights it, throws it over. Boom. 
All those dead fish come floating up to the top. The game one said, sir, that's illegal. He said, oh, yeah? Lights a second stick, hands it to that game warden, says, you're going to talk, you're going to fish. <laughs> Bible said, you shall receive power, dunamis, dynamite, dynamite. Friend, I don't know what traps the enemy's been trying to lay for you. I don't know what sinister pits Satan has tried to organize for you to fall into. But there is a God that's willing to give you victory tonight. There is a God. There is a God that is willing to give you victory tonight. Stand with me all over this house, please. I remember that old boy in Alabama. He told me, said, Brother Estes, he said, I was so hooked on crack cocaine. He said, every day all I thought about was smoking more, smoking more, smoking more, back to back, back to back. And then an old-time Pentecostal preacher told Sister Eric and me, he said, come by and preach to me. And God set us free. He said, my drug dealer come to me and said, listen, I want you to take this. This one's free. It's on me, okay? It's been a long time since I've seen you. And he looked at him and he said, You know what? God set me free from that. And you'll never see me again. And that man started turning out the door. About that time, that man told him, he said, Wait, stop! Come back! He walked back in that house. That man reached in his pocket. He said, God also made me an honest man. I still owe you some drug money from the last time I got a hit from you. Here, take it. He said, that drug dealer eyes got as big as saucers. He said, I can't take your money. Do me a favor. Give that to your pastor. Whatever you got is different from anything else I've ever seen. Friend, there ain't a medication like this. There ain't a prescription like this. There ain't a psychologist. Dr. Phil ain't got this answer. Say amen. Oprah Winfrey ain't got this answer. Say amen. But the word of God is still yea and amen. And he's still in the business of giving your mind victory. Giving your heart victory. Giving your life victory. Say amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed and no one looking around this evening. I want you to be honest with God tonight. Brother Estes, there's some things that I'm struggling with. And I need the help of the Lord in this house tonight. Nobody will thank you. God bless you. Thank you and thank you. Thank you and thank you and thank you. Nobody else is looking around. That's between you and the Lord. I want you to be honest with God. I'm not going to try to separate you to ever embarrass you. I would never do that. But I want you to be honest with God tonight. I need the help of the Lord. I feel Amalek breathing down my neck. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you. I feel, thank you, sir. I feel Amalek breathing down the back of my neck. And I want victory over that old man. I want to live. I want to walk in the Spirit. And I would not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I want to live filled with the spirit and power of God. Somebody else quickly here in this house. Quickly, one more time. Brother Estes, I'm struggling with some things. And I need God's help in this house tonight. Let you slip up your hand to heaven quickly. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, son. Thank you, young man. Praying your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Thank you, young lady. God wants to help you tonight. God wants to give you victory. God wants to give you strength. I said God wants to give you that blessing. And I can assure you the battle you win tomorrow is going to be very dependent on the God you touch tonight. Hallelujah. Whether you raised your hand or you did not raise your hand, I'm going to ask every last one of us that would to slip out from where we're standing this evening. And I want you to come around these altars. Whether or not you raised your hand, I want you to come. I want you to take a step of faith and just get out of that comfort zone of yours and meet us around these altars tonight and begin to ask the Lord, deal with us, God, deal with us. Come on all over this house from the back to the front. Would you come, every last one of us that would? We need your divine help, Lord. We need your divine strength, we need your divine wisdom. We need your divine anointing. Lord God, we need power over that.